So hi everyone, thank you very much um, for joining us today for uh, this week's Magnet Seminar. Um, we've got another great turnout, um, 46 people at the moment, and, and that will probably grow over the next few minutes. Um, for those who are sort of unfamiliar with the seminars, um, we'll have a 20 to 25 to 30 minute presentation. So we kindly ask that you keep your uh, microphones uh, muted uh, uh, during this time. But after the, the presentation, there'll be a chance for a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and, and discussion session. Um, so please uh, just raise your hand with the Zoom feature there, or if you're not quite sure, you can always just unmute and, and shout out. Um, but if you do want to ask a question, but you don't want to uh, appear on camera or um, um, unmute yourself, um, please just type in your question in the text chat and uh, one of us will read it out for you. Um, as always, we've got life going on uh, around us. Uh, many of us are at home, so if you do need to get up and go, um, please just, just go. It's not an issue at all. Um, and at the end of the seminar, we'll have a chance for a bit of a catch up, uh, a bit of a chit chat and socialising, uh, which won't actually be recorded. So it's a bit more uh, of a relaxed um, free for all. So today I'm very pleased to say that we have uh, Andrea Biderman um, from the University of Bern. And she will be talking to us today about uh, magnetic anisotropy in and pore space uh, characterization. So I shall um, hand over to you. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm very excited to, to talk about this very exotic topic to you today. So I'm um, just sharing my screen. All right, so what I wanna talk about is how we might apply magnetic anisotropy to characterizing pore space. And the idea behind this is that, well, we all know that we can characterize mineral alignment in rocks using magnetic anisotropy. And there are many empirical relationships telling us that the magnetic anisotropy indicates fabric orientation, and also that magnetic anisotropy can then um, tell us something about the degree of the anisotropy. A big advantage of the method is that it only takes us a couple of minutes to do a measurement. And with these couple of minutes, we are getting an average second order tensor, and that allows us to then describe the fabric in 3D. And it does not matter in which direction we are drilling our core or how we are orienting the sample because we are going to get that full 3D description anyway. Now, let's quickly think about whether or how we could apply this to characterizing pore fabrics. So pore fabrics, they are really important in any study where we are looking at fluid migration or when we want to characterize reservoirs because any anisotropy in the pore space might actually affect the fluid flow that we have in the subsurface. So when we do have an, anisot an anisotropic pore space, then we would expect that there is a preferred flow direction in which flow is faster. And if we are, for example, looking at contamination, also contamination would spread faster along that direction of preferred flow. And because of that, we would like to uh, be able to describe the pore space and the pore fabric. And with many of the traditional methods, we are going to run into problems because we can either look at very small samples at very high resolution, or we could look at larger samples at quite low resolution. And of course, what we would like is to look at a large sample that is representative at high resolution and with many methods that is not possible to do both at once. And then also, if we are looking methods that are, for example, based on X-ray tomography, they are very time consuming and they require a lot of storage space. Also, we would want a full 3D description of our pore fabric and we would like to get that independent of the orientation of our sample. Now, why is that important? It is important because if we are, for example, measuring permeability, 
instability. So we are measuring fluid flow directly on a sample. We can normally only measure that along the long axis of the core. So depending on how we drilled that core, we would then get a different value. And often people would then drill three perpendicular cores. But of course, if those do not contain the principal directions, we would then underestimate the anisotropy. And then also a last point we have to think about when we are interested in pore fabrics is that some of the pores are connected, so they do contribute to fluid flow, and other pores are isolated and they do not contribute to fluid flow. So we would rather only describe the connected pores. And one method with which we might be able to do that is the method of magnetic pore fabrics. What has been found in the past is quite promising empirical relationships between magnetic data and pore space or also fluid flow properties. So namely what people have found is that the maximum susceptibility that we measure is parallel to the elongation direction of the pores and also parallel to the flow direction, so the preferred flow direction. Meaning that if we measure uh, magnetic pore fabrics, we could then predict preferred flow directions. And a second set of empirical relationships that has been found is that a larger degree of anisotropy, so a larger ratio of maximum to minimum susceptibility, would indicate more anisotropic pore space and also a higher permeability anisotropy. And then it has been stated that with this method, we can isolate the connected pores. So we are only looking at the fraction of the pore space that is controlling fluid flow. It takes only a couple of minutes to measure the anisotropy. It is the same average second order tensor that we would measure with standard AMS measurements. So we are getting our full 3D information again, without needing any a priori information on how we have to orient our samples. And we can look at a representative sample volume and supposedly include pores down to 10 nanometers. And being able to do that, looking at small pores in a representative volume would kind of add this extra information in addition to what one could get with uh, tomography. There is just one problem with the method, and that's this really large variability that we have seen in the studies that were published so far. And when we are looking at this, we would see that a p-value, so an anisotropy degree of, for example, 1.6 could represent pores with an axial ratio of anything between two and 12. And because of that, these empirical relationships that we have at the moment are not very useful when we're trying to use the magnetic core fabrics in order to make a statement about our pore space. So the aim of my work and my group's work is that we would really like to be able to explain this large variability, because if we can explain it, then it would, would be possible to interpret magnetic pore fabrics quantitatively. Now, let's just take a step back and look again at the anisotropy description of mineral fabrics. There, we had a very similar problem in the early days of magnetic fabric research. Because yes, there are empirical relationships between magnetic anisotropy and strain or magnetic anisotropy and mineral alignment. But it was found that these relationships, they vary by rock type, meaning that many different empirical relationships were found depending on the lithology or also depending on, on the uh, on the exact uh, methodology that, that was used. And that's kind of what we see here, right? Again, with this really large variation. 
Also, it was found that our maximum and minimum susceptibility, they are not necessarily parallel to the lineation or parallel to the pole two foliation. And at that point, people could have given up and said, well, we are not using magnetic anisotropy anymore to describe mineral alignment, but that's not what happened. Rather, what happened is new methods were developed to look at either um, all the grains in our rock, which is what we're doing with the low field methods, or to isolate specific grains from our rock and then only uh, describe the fabric of those. And at the same time, people have uh, started developing models on the physical origins of the anisotropy and how we can predict uh, the, 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 me the measurements that, that we expect. So a big question now is, is it possible to, to transfer that to the study of magnetic pore fabrics? And if yes, would it help us with that large variability that was observed? And before I want to go into that, a quick overview of how we are measuring magnetic pore fabrics. So first of all, we have a sample. It could be a synthetic sample. I'm only going to show you results on synthetic samples today, but it could also be a rock sample, ideally a rock sample where we know something about the pore space, for example, with uh, X-ray tomography data. Then we are impregnating that sample with ferrofluid. We can use different types of fluids, also different concentrations, and then measure the anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility, which supposedly gives us an average for fabric. Now, what we have done is we've done these measurements at various frequencies, and we will see towards the end of this talk why it is important that we are measuring at various frequencies. So I said that I'm only going to show you today results on synthetic samples. And why are we looking at only synthetic samples? Well, a very big advantage is that we are having pores that are large enough so that we can characterize them independently. We can control the shape of the pores because we make them. We can also control the assembly of the pores, and we can compare any data with previously published results that exist on synthetic samples. And I'm going to show you two case studies here. First of all, I want to look into that sample that we see here on the left. And it is from a study that was taken by, uh, that was done by Jones et al. in 2006. And they had very carefully defined different types of fabrics that they were then uh, describing with simplified synthetic samples with a small number of pores. For, uh, for these pores, we know the, the size and shape of the individual pore. What we do not know from that study is the distance between the pores. But now let's just take this, uh, this sample that is supposed to show us a bedding type fabric. In this sample, we have a couple of pores aligned next to each other. They all have the same prolate shape. And let's see what we can do with what we know from the standard interpretation for magnetic fabrics and what's been published on magnetic core fabrics previously to see if we can predict the measurements that were reported in that study. So for magnetic core fabrics, the theory so far has been that the magnetic measurement would reflect an average pore shape and an average pore orientation. And the idea was that this would happen very similar to say having a magnetite grain surrounded by other grains, while we can also have a ferrofluid filled pore surrounded by other grains 
um, both of those are expected to have some shape in isotropy with the maximum susceptibility then parallel to the long axis of the grain or the long axis of the core. And this is where this empirical relationship is coming from, that the maximum susceptibility of the magnetic core fabric supposedly indicates the average core elongation direction. So I was calculating the anisotropy for the average pore shape and average pore orientation because all the pores are the same, that is equivalent to just modeling a single pore. Um, what I'm getting was this here. What Jones et al. measured is what we see there, and we see that there is quite a large uh, difference between my very simple model and the measurement. So obviously I have to adapt the model in order to do that better. And I then thought, okay, well, we don't have just one pore, we have several pores. So let's include distribution and isotropy because the pores that are next to each other, they are going to interact with one another. And distribution anisotropy has in the past been modeled for infinite assemblies of equal grains. And that's basically what I was doing here. And the result I'm getting is depending on the distance between the pores. So I'm kind of starting over here when I put my pores as far apart as I can within the dimensions of the sample and then I'm moving over that way um, when I'm putting my pores closer and closer together. Of course, the limit would be the moment where they are touching one another. And what we see is compared to the previous model, this is already doing better, but we still have a deviation. And in order to solve that, we said, well, wouldn't it be possible to just model the actual number of pores that we have in that sample rather than um, having to create an infinite line of pores? And that's what we did. And we were then developing a model that is a bit closer to reality. So what we see here on the left is the models that people were, done, were doing before, basically modeling shape and distribution and isotropy for assemblies of particles. So that could be grains, that could be pores that all have the same shape. They all have the same orientation and they are arranged either in lines as we see here, or they are arranged in planes um, where we have equal spacing in all directions between neighboring pores. And we said, well, in a real rock, it's unlikely that we have that. So we are trying to make a model that is able to calculate that distribution and isotropy for unequal um, sizes, unequal orientations, and unequal shapes. And the results of that model were actually quite promising because this is what I'm showing you here. So now the, the blue dots with the dashed line in between, we are getting very close to the actual measurement with a specific spacing between um, between the pores. So it was really nice to see that result because that tells me that with the current theory, when we are including both shape and isotropy and distribution and isotropy, we can explain that measurement. Now, it was not so easy when I tried to explain my own data. So now going over to the other set of synthetic samples that, that we had, and again, we followed the same procedure. So we had our samples with known dimensions, known geometry. Um, we were filling them with ferrofluid using different types and also different concentrations. 
and then using that model to predict what, what we should get. So what we see up here for the top group of samples, actually these samples, they are very simple. We have the same axial ratio for the core. It is a single core, so it's easy to model. And the only uh, thing that changes is the size of it. And what we did here is we were using the different fluids at different concentrations. And we found that the higher the susceptibility of the fluid, which depends on the type and the concentration, and the larger is the degree of anisotropy that we would expect for that given shape of the core. Then as we are diluting our ferrofluid, we are decreasing the degree of anisotropy that we are expecting. And in the lower set of samples, which we have here, we were then looking at assemblies, of course, where we were first filling a single one, then we were filling um, two at the corners, a third in the middle, we were adding a second line, and in the end we had all of the pores filled. Um, again, calculating models for different sizes and different aspect ratios, and we are getting slightly different values depending on the core assembly that, uh, that we are looking at. For that second series, we were only using the fluid with the highest susceptibility because we thought when we have the, the highest degree of anisotropy anyway, then it's easiest to actually see how it behaves. And here are now some of the data for the first set where we were, we are looking at the degree of anisotropy um, for the different fluids. So we have the water-based fluid, which has a higher susceptibility on the left. And then we have the oil-based fluid with a lower susceptibility on the right. And what we see here are, well, two characteristics. One is that the smaller samples that we're showing here with smaller symbols, they had a lot of artifacts. Those artifacts could be the ferrofluid uh, interacting with the seal. And over time, we had uh, air bubbles develop. We also had fluid move um, from under the seal and out of it. And we also had particle aggregation over time. And then of course, when your particle aggregate, as we see over here, uh, then we are no longer measuring the shape of the entire pore, but we are just measuring the shape of that cake of particles at the bottom. So that part we can explain. What we can't explain is this difference between the model and the measurements. Our measurements are constantly showing us lower anisotropy um, for the water-based fluid than what we expected. For the oil-based fluid, we are doing pretty okay. And very similar results we had for that second set of samples where we were looking at assemblies, of course. I'm only showing the two linear arrangements, um, but it was very similar for the, for the other sample sets too. So again, what we see here is that for the smallest samples, we are having artifacts. And then the other thing we see is uh, I'm showing you here the measured anisotropy as a function of frequency. Um, what we see is that the measured anisotropy decreases with increasing measurement frequency. And it's also always lower than what we modeled. So the pluses on the y-axis, those are the models. Um, and then the, the circles are indicating the measurements on the different samples. And now the big question was, how do we explain that, right? And what we found is that, especially that water-based fluid that we have here on the left, shows a very, very strong frequency dependence. Um, we also found that the frequency dependence is 
different for each of the ferrofluids. And well, for the water-based ferrofluids, almost always the susceptibility that we're measuring is way lower than the susceptibility that is uh, specified in the fluids technical specifications. Um, we could have a susceptibility, a measured susceptibility of around 20 to 30 percent of the, the specifications of the fluid. Whereas for the oil-based fluids, um, we were often getting susceptibilities between 120 and 130 percent of what was specified. But we know that the expected anisotropy depends on the susceptibility of the fluid. So what are we doing with these two pieces of information? Our fluid at measurement conditions has a different susceptibility from the one we expect. And the anisotropy that we expect depends on the fluid susceptibility. So going back um, to our published relationships, not all of them are actually specifying the fluid they used or the susceptibility of the fluid, but some of them were. And I was uh, running a model basically predicting what I would expect for these studies with the specified um, susceptibilities. And we see here the measurements in red and what I predicted was uh, not very similar, but when I then corrected for the assumed measurement frequency um, based on my own data, I was then getting uh, a relationship between the magnetic anisotropy and the actual ratio of the pore that was fitting a lot better with the measured data. So, the interpretation of that is that the variability in the empirical relationships that has been observed is simply because the data is not comparable. People were using different fluids with different susceptibilities. And because of that, we would actually expect them to get uh, different empirical relationships. We have also found that we cannot use the susceptibility that is specified um, by the fluid supplier for modeling. And we would really encourage anyone who is doing magnetic pore fabric work to check your effective uh, fluid susceptibility and specify that in your publications. The reason we are asking to do that is that once we know the properties of the fluid at measurement conditions, then we are pretty confident that a quantitative interpretation is possible. And we can then apply the magnetic pore fabric method to the rocks. So to sum up, the method of magnetic pore fabrics has the potential to efficiently characterize a rock's pore space. So far, the interpretation was somewhat compromised because we were only having um, empirical relationships and the differences between different studies were quite large. But we now have a model that explains this variability. And that tells us that a quantitative interpretation is now possible. And we are hoping that the method will be much more applied um, for fluid flow studies, aquifer and reservoir uh, characterization, maybe also geothermal and uh, CO2 applications. And I'm also taking the opportunity to just advertise other work that's going on in my group and that's going to be presented at EGU. One of my students is spending a lot of time correlating magnetic pore fabric results with other methods. And then my other student is working on improving impregnation methods. So if you're interested in those, you are finding the details of their presentations here. And with that, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Andrea. So we can all uh, give Andrea a virtual round of applause uh, via Zoom for, for a really interesting talk. Thank you. 
Thank you. So um, I'll open up the, the, the floor uh, to questions. So you can uh, raise your hand either via Zoom or throw a question into, uh, into the chat. If no one is going to open with a question, I certainly have a couple I can throw up. But I'll, there we go. We'll jump in with, with uh, Will McCarthy. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks for giving that talk. It's really, really interesting stuff. Um, I was just curious, uh, at, the mo at present, in order to, to do this, you, you basically need to impregnate the sample with feral fluid. Is there a way that you can do it or consider doing it without a feral fluid at all? Is there a way that we can look at the pore space without the feral fluid? Yeah. Um, well, in order to be able to look at shape anisotropy or to, to look at distribution anisotropy, we will have to have something magnetic inside the pores, right? There mm. are non-magnetic methods. Um, X-ray tomography is kind of the, the standard method that people use. However, they are having big trouble with the resolution. So if you're taking a, a standard sized core, they are reaching a resolution of one to 10 micrometers. And often that is kind of losing most of the, of the smaller pores. Yeah, the, the reason I ask, I, I mean, I, I kind of knew the answer, I suppose, but I was just hoping you had some magical solution. Um, <laughs> obviously, if you're interested in looking at something on the scale of a reservoir, be it you know, carbon capture or be it, you know, hydro, hydro system or whatever, um, you're dealing with quite a large area. So, so obviously to characterize that, it would be great to be able to analyze, you know, many samples very rapidly, which AMS is good at. Um, so yeah, I was just curious to see if, if, if there was a way of leapfrogging or potentially in the future a way of leapfrogging the ferro fluid bit. That's fine, thanks. Right, so, I mean, thanks. one, one idea that, that, that we, are, we have is um, to use other magnetic molecules such as uh, single molecule magnets because they might be smaller than the particles in the ferrofluid and they may be high, behave a bit better than uh, the ferrofluid with all the frequency dependence issues. Mm -hmm. cool. But other than right. that, I, I don't have the magical solution because otherwise I would have presented that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, sure, thanks. And thanks very much, Will. Uh, so Gunther has thrown a question into the, the chat um, asking about um, interactions between uh, the particles in the ferrofluid fluid and if there are any and how that might actually influence your susceptibility measurements. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it's something that we've been trying to look into and we didn't really get anywhere. Um, Normally, what people do in magnetic pore fabric studies is that they are treating the ferrofluid as a homogeneous fluid. So they are kind of ignoring the fact that we have particles and non-magnetic carrier fluid. Now, what we realized is that over time, and that means as our ferrofluid ages, and that could be times of, of days or weeks, the particles start aggregating and that also changes their magnetic properties. Um, those are data that we have collected and we have not really made a consistent story of those yet. That's why I'm not showing any of them. Um, but certainly there are interactions between the magnetic particles inside the fluid and they are changing the, the magnetic properties over time. And we will see where that's taking us. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so we have another, another question in the chat from uh, Leonid, um, who is asking about the uh, matrix material in the synthetic samples. If you could, um, maybe he missed it, describe a little bit of what the actual uh, matrix material is. Right. Um, I guess that, that question is what's getting me really into trouble with the geochemists, because the, the reason I'm using synthetic samples is I'm trying to, or the, the only part I'm interested in 
is getting a pore of a known shape. Um, we were using uh, a polycarbonate plastic for that. And I'm totally aware that some people are gonna tell me that it has a different wettability compared to your standard rock. So the, the material we were using was, was plastic because it's making it simple for us. We can see what's going on. So for example, um, when we had particle aggregation, we could see that right away. It's not your best uh, equivalent for a rock from the chemical perspective. Mason, thank you very much. And so uh, Andre has his hand up for a question. Okay, Andre, great talk, thank you. And I have a little bit of uh, concern with uh, the choice of, uh, of the choice of materials. Uh, for modeling, because uh, uh, the organics in particular and water are diamagnetic, and if you apply different frequency, uh, uh, different frequencies, then uh, your susceptibility, uh, diamagnetic susceptibility, rises as a function of uh, linearly as a function of frequency. You, you can easily find it out when you try to measure your. Uh, sample holder with MFK, MFK to, uh, at two frequencies. And uh, how, uh, how do you account for this? So if I got that right, you're asking for the changes in susceptibility of the, of the plastic part of the sample. Of the pla yes, yes. Yes. Um, I was measuring that separately and I was subtracting it from my okay. measurement. Yeah. And uh, how big uh, how big was that, uh, was this effect actually? How big was sorry I didn't uh, get that. Uh, how how big was the effect of uh, changing the frequency on the on the empty sample? On the empty sample, um, it was a lot weaker than what I see for the ferrofluid. If you're interested in the actual numbers, I can send them to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. So thanks very much. And so um, Vladimir has his hand up and we've got another question in the chat as well. So we'll start with Vladimir. Okay, uh, thanks. Hopefully I'm uh, audible. Um, I have a question. Uh, great talk, Andra. It's very interesting what you are trying to do. Um, I have a question. When you, when you were trying to model the, the anisotropy, the distribution anisotropy actually, with uh, you new um, to the fin irsda or how it's pronounced, um, uh, you uh, you actually mentioned that uh, your results shuffle within within the um, within the space of the results. What was the variable you were changing in the model as you were trying to represent the actual distribution of the pores pores in your sample? So what was the variable you were changing to move the move the result in, in, the, in the space? Thanks. Right, so, so what you're asking about is, is kind of this graph, right? What's changing um, while we're yeah, yeah. on the in, line? Exactly, in the model you were uh, using with, the, with, the, with your new tool, the fin irtsta. Right, so, um, I mean, what did we do to get this? We know, we know the susceptibility, the average susceptibility of the fluid inside the pores. We know the, the size or the dimension of the pores. The only part we do not know is the spacing between them, right? Because in, in that paper, they had given the, the size of their entire sample and they had given the size of the pore, but not the spacing. So we have some constraints because the way that we can put the pores apart is having the outer pores touch the sample surface. And the closest we can have them together is have them touch each other. And basically when we are moving between these points from here and over to there, the only part that I'm changing is the spacing between the pores. Um, 
here I'm doing that for the finite number of four or five cores that I have in the sample. While on this line there, I was doing the exact same thing, um, but using an infinite line of cores, right? Because I was first using the, the model that was available. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I didn't catch that it was, you didn't know the, the spacing of the pores that it was the information missing. So now it makes a great sense that you are able to find a good result. Thanks, thanks, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for That's giving great. me the opportunity to clarify that. Thanks very much. So we, we have one time for a, one last quick question from the chat from Gunther. Uh, who was asking, uh, he saw the, the Agico's uh, Kappa bridge, he was asking if you used um, any other instruments that would use uh, run at frequencies uh, that are not part of the Agico measurement routine. Um, yes, I did. So what I was using here is kind of the, the red data that you see here is the uh, Agico Kappa bridge results. Um, measured at 1, 4, and 16 kilohertz. And then I was also using the SM150 instrument that is, um, it's made by ZH Instruments, so it's another Czech company. They are nominally reaching frequencies between 60 hertz and 512 kilohertz. Um, I only did some initial measurements with that instrument because what you see down here on the second plot that's uh, normalized by the, by the ferrofluid volume is that for all sample except the largest one, I have such a big noise level that uh, it's very hard to see any frequency dependence. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll we'll draw the uh, question uh, session uh, to a close for uh, for today. Uh, so I just want to ask everybody to give uh, Andrea another uh, round of applause for uh, a really uh, great and, and well presented talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to present that topic to you, and I really appreciated all the questions and the ideas. And we've had another another uh, great turnout uh, today. So thanks everybody for that. Um, but before we sort of end the um, session for today, I just got a couple of um, quick reminders and, and, and announcements to make. Um, so this will be uh, the last magnet seminar before we go for a break for um, EGU. Um, and we will return on uh, May 19th um, with a speaker to be confirmed. Um, but we'll just have a, a single uh, seminar in the period between EGU and the IRM conference, which is in the uh, beginning of, of uh, June. Um, but following the IRM conference, we will um, open up our um, European and Eastern Hemisphere time slot uh, with Andrew Roberts from Australia National University. The exact time slot is to be uh, decided. It's most likely going to be 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Uh, in British time. Um, and we're just working with our speakers in the Eastern Hemisphere uh, to work out what's going to be the best time uh, for those guys. Um, but as always, we're looking for um, more speakers. So if you are interested in presenting your uh, latest research at Magnets, please uh, reach out to myself or to uh, Anita. And just as a, another reminder, um, all of our um, uh, videos and seminars are recorded and will be are available on, on YouTube. And uh, this talk will be put up uh, a little bit later this week. Um, and so if you've missed anything or if there's something you want to go back and look at, um, there's, all the seminars are there for you to, to use. And we have citable uh, DOIs as well. So if you do find something interesting that you want to use, uh, you can uh, cite your work. And just as a, a very quick, uh, announcement um, um, for our colleagues in uh, the Institute of Rock Magnetism. Uh, later on this year, they'll have their 12th IRN conference on rock magnetism. It's running from uh, June 1st to the 4th, uh, 2021. And this year it's gonna be held uh, like all conferences uh, virtually. 
Uh, and so there is the option for doing a free registration. There's no uh, registration fees, but there are a limited number of, of positions available. Uh, and if you want to find out some more information, uh, have a look at their um, uh, the IRM website or reach out to Max Brown um, at the IRM at uh, umn.edu. So thank you all very much. Uh, and thank you for joining this week's Magnets. <laughs>